Okay, hello and welcome back to Nomenclature. This is part two of several parts of a presentation. Just in the fact that there is a, a lot of material and it's very easy in this case to break it up over smaller uh, multiple increments as opposed to presenting it all at once. And three parts which uh, some of the other presentations have been, just does not work for this one. So anyway, we are continuing with nomenclature of basic inorganic compounds. It's uh, effectively chapter seven, but there's an asterisk there because I'm presenting a different way to name and write formulas than the book does. However, we will in the end be able to name and write formulas for the same compounds regardless of the strategy that you use to get there. Now this is simply a review of the early slides from the first part of the presentation and it serves as an outline for what we are doing. So I will just skip over this other than saying that we have already covered what is called a type 1 ionic compound and we are now going to talk about type 2 ionic compounds and in this presentation we will also have a very brief mention because it doesn't take much for hydrates at the very end of this presentation over the last, I don't know, two, three, or four slides. Uh, we will eventually, in the next presentation, talk about type 3, a different presentation. We'll talk about all of type 4 acids, both types. And there will be a little bit more after that. I have included uh, the slides for crisscrossing. And you can review these at your own leisure. Uh, this was more thoroughly explained uh, in great detail in the first presentation. And if you need a review on crisscrossing other than looking at the slides, I would recommend you go back and view that part of the presentation again. Whether you view the narrated version as a video or just the slide presentation without any narration at all. Okay, so uh, now that we are at type 2, let's talk about the type 2 compounds. Now, just before I flip the slide, a word about type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. This naming system, which is very easy, type 1, you know, how hard is it to come up with that? It's not necessarily very clever. But that labeling system is unique to Stephen Zumdahl. If you went to a college professor and said, oh yeah, that's a type 1 compound, they may or may not know what you're talking about. If they are familiar with uh, Stephen Zumdahl's high school textbook, then they would say, well, yes, it is. However, uh, Zumdahl simply created this labeling system to group the rules on how to write a formula and name a formula uh, and that's all it really is. And he found that you could do it effectively for the simple compounds with four types. And he just named them type 1, 2, 3, and 4. So that's all that is. Uh, and we're going to call these, like him, type 2. Type 2. Well, type 2 compounds will be unique in that they will start with a variable cation. This is one of that table B set of ions that you have on your ion sheet. Now that by no means is a complete list of all of the variable cations, but if you have your periodic tables that I gave you at the beginning of the year, and if you need them, of course, I still have them available upon request. You'd have to go to the high school and pick them up though. That uh, there are many variable cations indicated on that, but we'll go with our list. And it'll be combined with any negative ion, any anion, either front or back of your list. So that's what they are. This explains what a variable cation is, and the anions can come from anywhere. Negative. So looking at your ion sheet, what are we talking about? Well, down here, table B, these are your variable cations. And I would have asked you in class to memorize from copper all the way through manganese in this entire list, both stock, Latin, stock and Latin for the lower and higher charges, and then this group down here. I have included a few extras, not for memorization, but for looking up and using on homework assignments. The negative ions, well, here are your monoatomic anions, and of course, all of the polyatomics as well. Here is a close-up of those table B variable cations, and we have to have a way in the name 
to tell when it's copper with a one positive charge, losing one valence electron, or copper with a two positive charge, losing two valence electrons. It is very situation specific in chemistry as to what copper will do. And so we have to have a way to show what copper did after it has reacted and created a compound. So we have this stock system, which has been around for a long time, but it is the newer system. And it uses the Roman numerals. Uh, very adaptable because if we discover that copper has five charges, we can just use Roman numerals until we have all five charges covered. Whereas the Latin, which used the Latin word if available and a suffix, uh, in this case, O-U-S or I-C, that's all you really had. If it went beyond two charges, then we had to have a different system, maybe a different prefix, start, you know, start bringing in prefixes or using other types of suffixes. So the Latin system was very restrictive. The stock system is, is very easy to use, very adaptable. But because both systems are around, we will learn both systems. Uh, I do use the stock system almost exclusively, but I do understand and expect you to understand how to use the Latin system. And correct spelling, just like what would happen on a quiz, is always expected. Here are your anions. This is your monoatomic anions from nitride all the way to astatide. Uh, no surprise there. Here's the list of polyatomic ions. Again, accepting ammonium, uh, ammonium at the top, that uh, it's the only positive ion there. Everything else being negative can function as the anion, even with the type 2s. Okay, well, the rules. Here again is where I would be asking you to write all of this down in your notes, and I believe being home and watching this is no exception. You should be taking these notes. It's your way to interact with the material. This will be pretty critical to you in college if you ever take online classes in college or uh, watching a presentation after the fact uh, in your dorm room at college. So I strongly recommend it. Otherwise, you're going to be, uh, you're going to get certainly less out of it, and you may actually be confused. Okay, so this is going to show you about the stock system. So what if we have a formula and we want to name it? So formula to name. If we're going to use the stock system, meaning Roman numerals, that's what the stock system means, remember that all compounds begin with a variable cation that is named first with its full name, and now it will be followed by a Roman numeral in parentheses to indicate the charge of the cation. So... If we discover for in the formula that the Fe iron has a two positive charge, in the name we would start iron, Roman numeral two in parentheses. Or on the other hand, if we discover that the iron in a compound is iron with a three positive charge, we would name it iron, Roman numeral three. However, in the Latin system, while the cation is always still named first, now we will use the Latin name and the suffix O-U-S when the cation has its lower charge. So here's where you have to recognize, oh yeah, iron, two positive, is the lower charge. I'm going to use ferrous because ferrum is Latin for iron and ferrous then is the iron with the lower, the, uh, excuse me, the lower charge. Whereas we will use the suffix IC with the Latin name in order to indicate the higher charge. So when we talk about iron with the three positive charge, I would have to recognize, oh, that's the higher of the two charges. I'm going to call this ferric. So ferrous or ferric, or go with the stock system. Well, what about the anion? Well, the anion is still named last, and it's always named the same way it is in type 1s. So if you remember how you did it with the type 1s, it's done exactly the same way for the type 2s. And you can look over this, but essentially this says if it's a nonmetal, we use the IDE name like nitride, oxide, sulfide. If it ends with a polyatomic ion, we use that polyatomic ion's full name. Okay, now how do we determine the charge of the cation? Well, there are two ways to do this. Now we'll show you an examples coming up. But what if there is no subscript? If there is no subscript in your compound's formula, what would you do? Well, I would determine the charge of the negative ion, the anion, because it's a known value. You just look it up. If it's nitrate, you look it up. It's negative one. If it's 
uh, sulfide S, you look it up, it's a negative two. Or you have these memorized, which is even better. I cannot emphasize that enough, that if you memorize them, it just goes so much faster. But in any case, you look up or you know the charge of the anion all the time. And if you do, the cation must have the same numerical charge. Of course, it'd have to be positive because it's a cation, because it had to cancel out the anion's charge, which is why there was no subscript to begin with. When they cancel, no subscript. That's why. So by knowing the charge of the anion, you know the charge of the cation, and now you can name it correctly. Here's the example, FeO. I don't know the charge of the iron, but I do know that oxygen is always a negative two charge. So if oxygen up here is a negative two, the iron must be a positive two to numerically cancel that out. And so therefore this thing is iron, Roman numeral two, oxide, or you use the Latin, ferrous oxide. What if you have subscript? Well, if you have subscript, that subscript came from crisscrossing unlike charges. And so we can just reverse the process by re-crisscrossing the subscript back up to the charges, which are, I guess, superscript. And then we can name from there. So what does this say specifically? Re-crisscross the subscript back to being oxidation numbers. Always check to make sure that the recrisscrossed uh, re oxidation number for the negative ion, the anion, is correct. Sometimes you're going to recrisscross, and that negative ion should be, like for oxygen, a negative two, but it's not. You recrisscross, and for whatever reason, it's a negative one. Well, that indicates that your compound's formula has been reduced. And so you would double the negative one in oxygen to make it a negative two, which is now correct. And if you double the oxygen, whatever the cations charge was, you would also have to double that to make it correct. So this is the only way that I am aware of where you can catch formulas that have been reduced by recrisscrossing and checking the anion. If it's correct, you're good to go. The, cat, the positive ion will be correct. If it's not, you're gonna probably have to double it or triple it or quadruple it to make it correct. Whatever you do to the negative ion to make it correct, you'll have to do that to the positive ion to make it correct. Once it's correct, you can name it with the Roman numeral stock system or the Latin system. Okay, and that's all this explains there. So I'm gonna just move on. Well, it's best then to just talk about some examples. So here I have several examples. On the, the left, I have a copper and a nitrate combination. Here I have a copper and a nitrate combination, but it's written differently. I have parentheses in a, in a subscript of two out here. Here I have iron and a carbonate compound. Here I have a chromium and a permanganate polyatomic ion compound. Here I have gold and a sulfate. Down here, mercury and a phosphate. Tin and oxygen, and down here again, tin and oxygen, but a different formula. And so how would I go about naming these? Well, it's all about, do I have subscript or don't I? And if I don't, then I use the charge of the negative ion. So in the first one here, copper nitrate. In this compound, I have no subscript. And you may say, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Spence. There's a three right there. But that three did not come from crisscrossing. That three goes with the nitrate. And so you can't do anything to it. You can't take it away from nitrate. So there is technically no subscript in this compound. Okay, well, what do I do? No subscript. You use the negative ion charge because you know it, you memorize it, or you look it up. So I look it up, I memorize it, and I find that nitrate is a negative one. If nitrate is a negative one, the copper must be a positive one to numerically cancel so there was no crisscrossing to begin with. So this would have been copper, Roman numeral one, nitrate, copper, one, nitrate, and the one written as a Roman numeral in parentheses. That's how you would do that. With subscript, we can re-crisscross. But I have this written out, so let's actually see this physically in the next slide. Okay, here's that first example I just told you about. I will breeze over this quickly because I just explained it. So Cu103, no subscript. This explains about the nitrate, and you can't use the three from nitrate as subscript. Well, I do know 
that the nitrate is a negative one because I can look that up. Well, if nitrate is a negative one, then the copper must have been a positive one to cancel it. So therefore, I now know the charge of the copper. The copper is a positive one charge. I can name it copper, parentheses, Roman numeral one, nitrate. Or if I want, or if it's requested once in a while, I will specifically on a worksheet request you use the Latin name. And that would then in this case be cuprous nitrate. Let's check out another example. Here is the other copper nitrate combination on that example page. But now I have subscript. Because I have subscript, I can recrisscross. So I take the subscript from down here, but Spence, there is nothing written there. If there's nothing written, it's a one. So I'm going to recrisscross that up there and make it a one negative. So I recrisscross the metal subscript and make it a negative charge because the second substance is always the anion. If the anion's charge is correct, then the or for the anion rather, then the cation's charge is also correct. Well. When I recrisscross the negative one, nitrate has a negative one charge, and I know this for, for a fact. So therefore, this two now, when it recrisscrosses up to the copper, this two is also correct. Now I can name it. Copper, Roman numeral two in parentheses, nitrate, so copper two nitrate, or in Latin, cupric nitrate. And that's how that works. Let's check out one more example before we move on. Okay, um, actually there may be two examples to be honest with you. So here is a gold sulfate combination. So I do see subscript and therefore I can recrisscross. So the two from gold recrisscrosses up to the sulfate, I make it negative because the second thing is always negative. So sulfate, two negative charge. I look at my ion sheet, I have it memorized. It is a two negative charge, that is correct. So, when the three comes up to make it three positive, that is also correct. Once I do that, I'm done. Name it. Gold, Roman numeral three, sulfate, of course in parentheses, or if you like the Latin, auric sulfate. Okay, I do have one final example handwritten before we move on and go to the opposite of naming formulas, or uh, going, going from a name to a formula. Okay, in this example, I have a tin oxygen combination and I see subscript, so I can recrisscross. So I take the one down here, this SNO2, that's, that's a one right there, you just never write it, but I take that and I make it up, uh, crisscross it up here to make it a one negative. Well, the one negative for oxygen is not correct. Oxygen never has a negative one charge in this case. So in order to make it correct, I need to double that charge to make it a two negative. If the anion was not correct, then neither is the cation when you recrisscross it. So you're gonna have to double it as well. Just like in math class, what you do to one side, you gotta do to the other, same thing here. If you double one, you gotta double the other. So let's see what I did. So the one came up, recrisscrossed, it wasn't correct, I doubled it, making it a two negative, and that is oxygen's charge, two negative. Well, the two crisscrossed up for 10, that would not be correct either, I double it, make it a four positive, that is now correct. So now I can name it 10 Roman numeral four oxide or stannic oxide. Okay, so that is effectively how you go from a formula to a name, which I think is a little more difficult than going the opposite way. And we will then find going from a name to a formula will be our next part of our conversation. <coughs> Excuse me. So here is uh, all of the answers actually for uh, the examples from that page. Uh, I just worked out about four of them. You can look at the others. And if you want me to work out any of these, by all means, just drop me a request somehow, either in the posts on the classroom or text or email or, or a call or something. And I'll certainly work them out and post them somewhere. Okay, let's go the opposite way. What if we have an A? and we wanna to go to a formula, so how do we do that? I think this is actually a little easier, uh, but let's check it out. So here is again where I would ask you to be writing these notes down so you have them. So what are you gonna do? Well, you will write the elements and or polyatomic ions in order from the name, 
and then you will automatically assign them their oxidation numbers. Think about if you had that ion chart memorized, how quickly that would go. If you have to look everything up, you're going to take three times longer than anybody else. And so it's just a matter of speed, right? So here the oxidation number for the cation will come from the name. You don't have to look that up because it's going to say like iron 2 oxide. Well, iron 2 oxide, that's iron with the two positive charge. That's where you get that from. Now, if the oxidation numbers are the same, like a 2 positive and a 2 negative, remember they just cancel. So you don't crisscross or anything. You just simply eliminate the charges and rewrite the formula without any subscript, without any oxidation numbers. One example here would be cobaltic phosphate. Cobaltic is cobalt. IC is the cobalt with the higher charge. And so that turns out to be CO with the three positive. Phosphate, I have memorized, is PO4 with a three negative. Well, the three and the three cancel. So therefore, I just eliminate them and I rewrite it COPO4. That O is lowercase, this O is uppercase because one is just part of cobalt, the other is its own element oxygen. Notice I did not need to keep the parentheses around phosphate without any subscript that goes outside of the phosphate to indicate you have multiple uh, phosphates in the compound. You just don't need the parentheses, but you can leave them in there all the time if you like. I've had a lot of students that like to leave the parentheses all the time, and that's fine. As long as when you need subscript, it's there, and if you don't, it's not. But the parentheses then, you know, it's it becomes optional. Okay, well, what if the oxidation numbers don't cancel out? Well, you or you crisscross them, rather, and then uh, if you can, reduce them to lower terms. So that's all this slide says. It's exactly the same as it was in the type 1s. So you can read this slide a little bit more carefully, write down all the notes, but it's pretty much identical to type 1. So let's move on. Okay, here I have several examples. Lead 2 nitride, lead 4 iodide, tungsten 5 hydroxide, nickelic sulfide, stannic carbonate, cupric acetate, mercury 1 oxalate, and ferric hydrogen sulfate. I have written out uh, two or three of these, and then we'll take a look at all of the answers, and then we'll start to wrap this up with a brief discussion on hydrates. Okay, let's take a look at lead 2 nitrate, the first example. Lead has a symbol of PB. Lead 2 tells me to use the 2 positive charge. So that's easy. You know, I just write that down. Nitrate, if I haven't memorized, it goes really quick because I just write down NO3. I dump it quickly in parentheses. I don't know if I need them or not, but I'm going to put the parentheses down and I write a 1 negative charge because that's what nitrate's charge is. The 2 and the 1 don't cancel, so I crisscross. When I crisscross, I end up with this formula, Pb with a 1, so I just don't write it, and NO3 with a 2 outside of parentheses. These parentheses are mandatory because you have two nitrates. Without them, it looks like you have 32 oxygens, and that is not correct. Okay, so there's your formula. There's nothing more to do, and it cannot reduce any, so you're done. Let's check out stannic carbonate. Well, stannic is tin, so SN. Stannic is the higher charge, and so that's a 4 positive. Stan uh, tin is either a 2 positive or a 4 positive. This is the higher charge. How do I know that? Because I've memorized it, and it goes that quick. Carbonate is CO3, and it has a 2 negative charge, and immediately I just put it in parentheses. That way they're there in case I need them. Well, 4 and a 2. They do not cancel, so I crisscross. The 4 comes down to the carbonate, the 2 comes down to the tin, and I write it down here, SN2, parentheses, got to have them, CO3, because the 4 is outside. But, 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 can be reduced. This one can be reduced. Notice the 2 and the 4 coming from uh, crisscrossing can be reduced to lower terms. So I divided them both by 2, and this is my final formula, SN2. CO3, 2. I still have to have the parentheses because there's a 2 applying to the carbonate. But basically, a 2 to 4 ratio is the same thing as a 1 to 2 ratio. And we always want to represent these formula unit ratios and in their lowest terms. Okay, let's move on to the last handwritten example. 
Okay, here is mercury one oxalate. Mercury one is the mercury with the one positive charge. Oxalate, I have memorized, C2O4. I dump it in parentheses, put a two negative outside of it because that's its charge. A one and a two do not cancel, so I crisscross. When I crisscross, I end up with, uh, oh, I'm sorry, down here, Hg2 and then a carbonate, a single carbonate. Now you can write it exactly like this and leave the parentheses and that's perfectly fine. You will find that uh, chemists, because we are very lazy and when we don't have to do something we won't, most chemists would write it this way, eliminating the uh, parentheses because you just don't need them. But either way is correct. I'm, I'm certainly fine with uh, when you don't need them, you include them and, and that's fine. Okay, so here is then all of the final answers. Um, so actually, it looks like I have lead to nitride and I might have done lead to nitrate in my example. So my bad on that one. So this one I actually did not do. I did a separate example, but here you go. Here are the answers. You can take a look over these and figure out, do your own method on seeing if you can reproduce all of these answers. Uh, but there you have all of the examples. Okay, I'm going to move on from the type two, I believe into the hydrates. And here we are with the hydrates. Well, what is a hydrate? A hydrate, you know, think about being hydrated. You know, you've drank enough water, you know. So are you hydrated or are you dehydrated? You don't have water, right? So with hydrates, that's all it is. These ionic substances are all in their solid phase. They are all crystals. And when they form as crystals, they can form in water environments. Many of these ionic substances, when they crystallize, lock in, trap water inside the crystalline structure, that crystalline lattice we talked about earlier. So because the water gets trapped, we have to account for it because it's there. It's part of the crystal now. So we call these crystals hydrated. Just like you drinking a lot of water, you are hydrated. Same thing here. So what does this say? We will, uh, you with hydrates, we will name and write formulas exactly like the type ones or the type twos. There is no modification of the rules there. Waters are simply going to be in addition to everything we are doing, and it's really simple to add them. So additional water groups will be called in this instance hydrates. We won't really call them waters, they're hydrates. We will use prefixes to tell how many water groupings, how many hydrates have been added, uh, have been locked in to the uh, crystal, right? And these prefixes in the name will identify how many hydrates should be present in a formula. So let's take a look at some examples. That's the easiest way to do it. So in order to do the examples, we will need a list of prefixes. If you are handwriting your notes, here's what I would suggest. You get the one through 10 and you get the prefixes mono through deca. I would not write any of this other information to the right because these are simply showing you how it would work as far as the mono comes in front of a hydrate, meaning monohydrate. If the XY is an ionic formula, then the monohydrate would show up in addition to, just kind of at the end, a big old dot that separates the compound from the water, and then we have simply one water group. See, there's no number, so it's just one water. Notice with a dihydrate, whatever this compound is, big old dot, now two water groups. That's a dihydrate. And you can see then trihydrate, tetrahydrate, pentahydrate, hexa hydrate, hepta hydrate, octa hydrate, nona hydrate, and then finally decahydrate. Are there bigger hydrates than decahydrate? Yes, there are, but we are, we are only going to worry about up to 10, prefixes going up to 10. Okay, so here are two examples. One name that we would want to give a formula to and one formula that we would want to name. Notice up here, copper, Roman numeral two, sulfate. This is a type two compound. And so what do we do? We would write the symbols down in order, assign their oxidation numbers, see if we got a crisscross, crisscross and reduce if you do. After you have a formula, we simply add on pentahydrate, which is five water groupings. What is that gonna look like? Well, the answer will be up in a moment, but look at this example down here. This is not the same compound, but notice we have a formula, 
This ta happens to be a type 1 formula, by the way, but we have a formula, big old dot, and some waters. So this formula should look very similar. A formula, big old dot, and some waters. So that's how I kind of use information around me to go, oh wait, these hydrates, what does it gotta look like? Well, the formula must look something like this. And if I name this formula, it should look something like this name. So that's how I would do that. Okay, well, let's just see the answers. I did not handwrite this out, so let's just see the answers. Okay, here we are. So copper with a Roman numeral two is copper two, so there would be a two plus charge here. Sulfate, because I have memorized it, is, a, uh, is an SO4 with a uh, two negative charge. And I just noticed that as it was typed, this should be a four down here, and there is no four. So that's a typo on my part, my bad. The formula otherwise is correct. There should be no other subscript, uh, but I'm missing a four there. Then pentahydrate, big old dot, five waters. So there you go. So this should read CUSO4 dot 5H2O. Then we have this formula here and we name it. Mg is magnesium. PO4 is a phosphate. It is not a type 2 compound. So there's no Roman numeral. There's no Latin. There's no anything like that. You just name it. So magnesium phosphate. And notice I have three water groupings. So trihydrate. And basically, hydrates are that simple. There's no difference in the naming and the formula writing. The only difference is, in addition to it, you're going to either have in a formula a dot and some waters, or in a name, you're going to just follow it up with a prefix and a hydrate. That is the last slide. Thank you for hanging with me. Uh, type 3 is a very short presentation, and that will be following in a day or two, followed by the acids, and then followed finally by what is called empirical formulas, which that part will go hand in hand with your book, by the way. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would suggest you look for the type 2 worksheet, which is uh, uh, will be posted. And you can work down through that. It's a smaller grid sheet like the type 1. And there will also be uh, a little bit of maybe graded work for the type 2. Thank you.